When we first bought this lake in 2011, we really had no idea what we were getting into. We knew nothing about fishery management. Three years after we bought the lake, we had a really nasty surprise. We had a visit from a local fishery manager. What we weren't expecting was for him to tell us our lake was not healthy. What we didn't understand, what was going on underneath the surface was really bad. And the problem was that there had been too many trees let go over too many years and this leaf fall has built up and accumulated over a long period of time. This lake was originally dug way back in the 60s. So there are decades and decades of silt that have accumulated. Every year, trees grow, leaves fall in the water and they decompose over time and become silt. Now, if that process is in equilibrium, then the decomposing matter is being broken down and turned into silt and it's all working great. The problem becomes when there's too much leaf fall and the lake can't break down those leaves quickly enough. Then what happens is layer after layer builds up and builds up. On the top you'll get this lovely layer of aerobic silt that contains lots of life, lots of natural food for the fish. But below that you'll get a thick, dark, black, horrible, stinking layer. That's the black anaerobic silt. And that can be a problem for the condition and health of the lake. And it's in this anaerobic layer where gases such as methane and hydrogen sulfide are made and trapped. So if you're out in a boat or in a set of waders and you're prodding around exploring the lake bed, then if you smell that rotten egg smell, then you know that you've found a layer of anaerobic silt. The most effective but expensive method of removing silt is to remove it mechanically. And that's what we did way back in 2014. We drained down the lake completely, we took out all of the fish and we sent them to a storage basin for safekeeping for three months. We then got some excavators in and a team of professionals to do a huge desilting project. The good news was that during the dig out we realised that we have lots of blue and brown clays. Now these clays are really rich in minerals which is very good for the health of the carp. So here we are on the island margin, that's the actual edge of the bank there and wherever you're near to the margin you're generally going to have this hard layer so you can actually hear, I've got a hollow drainage pipe here and you can hear this stick banging away and that's on rock hard gravel. So you've got this roadway basically, despite the fact that we're underneath the trees here the fish are cleaning this area. If, the, if there was no fish here there would be leaf debris here, that's just the way it is. So I know that there's fish activity here because it's clean. As we move out into the deeper water I'm just tap tapping away as we go here and then it goes from bang hard to slightly crunchy and soft and this is what I call the transition layer. We've got a nice aerobic layer of silt on top of the rock hard structure of the lake bed. Now there's no bubbles being released so I'm not in the anaerobic layer yet, but I just am. There we go, the bubbles are coming up and if I press through that layer yeah about six inches I can put my tube in there so I can also use this tube to take samples of what the water looks like down on the bottom. So if I just put my hand over this tube, get some air in it, block the tube, and this is on the rock hard stuff, just tap away there, bleed some air into it, and then we lift the tube up, and I release that, and a little bit of silt there, not very clean, should have been cleaner. So it might sound hard, but it wasn't really polished. That's, that's a little bit better. So 
So this is one of the tools that I use to understand whether the fish are feeding or not. Basically all I do is apply bait to a spot and then go out the next day, take a sample from that spot and if there's uneaten food then I'll see it in terms of you know, whole pellets or bits of broken down pellets. Uh, if they've had a lot then it'll basically be tap water clean and uh, I know that I can safely apply more bait because they have had the lot. Carp can eat an extraordinary amount of food but we don't want too much food going in there because that's going to put too much load on the system because once food goes in it becomes organic matter and is it eaten by the carp? If it's eaten by the carp then the food becomes carp poo obviously and, but that still has to be broken down and converted into silt and all of these processes consume oxygen and if there's not enough oxygen then the carp are going to suffer hypoxia and die so it's really important that we keep the whole system in balance not too much leaf fall not too much food but again they've got to have enough of all of these ingredients to be healthy and happy so as we come away from the margin and come out into the central channel, this is where the majority of all the old silt has accumulated. There's only one way to get rid of silt on this scale and that's through mechanical excavation. It's complicated, expensive, we've done it but we can only do so much. I'm just going to float this tube down here, I could drive that down a couple of feet fairly easily. And if we pick that tube up, you can see we've got a huge, great load of horrible stinking clay. And I've blocked my tube as well. So there's plenty of old gloopy black horrible silt in here still. But, you know, that, that's okay. You know, we can make it work like it is. It's never going to be perfect, but we just do the best that we can. A load of fresh um, spawn on that. Oh, look. So the fish started spawning again a couple of days ago. This is the second spawning event of the season. Carp spawn in different size groups. The small ones go first, then the medium, then the large. Sometimes the large carp and the medium carp will spawn at the same time. So we've had one spawning event a number of weeks ago. That was a fairly short affair that was over and done with. Uh, for the last couple of days, the bigger carp have been spawning. And we can see the evidence of a successful spawning stuck to anything that's in the water. So just been rowing along here and this oar has picked up some eggs. Fish eggs, once they're fertilised, become very, very sticky and they won't adhere to anything. The lake was originally dug back in the 60s, but in 1980 it was purchased by a local fisherman. There were a huge number of poplar trees. When the leaves fall, the leaves acidify the water and that's going in the wrong direction. We actually want the water to be more alkaline rather than more acidic. Poplar leaves also take a very long time to decompose. So it's a problem that gets worse and worse over many years and never goes away. Over the years, we've removed 50 or so of these massive trees to reduce the amount of leaf fall during the autumn. Most of our tree maintenance work takes place at this time of year in the winter, but sometimes nature has other ideas. And this June, when we had clients in, we lost two trees while the guy was fishing. Luckily, Philip was absolutely brilliant and was happy to pitch in to help us get it sorted as quickly as possible. He even managed to catch two carp while I'm busy chainsawing away. So it just goes to show you that sometimes carp really aren't that bothered about bank side noise. The two trees that came down were actually on the cutting list for this winter but nature beat us to it and they came down anyway. We were enormously grateful to Philip and Emma for the help that they gave us and interrupting their holiday. We literally couldn't have done it without you guys. Go on brother. You get an official certificate and everything. Tree fella. Yeah. Carp spawn sometime between mid-April and mid-June. It's all down to the water temperature. That thrash was so loud it scared the ducks that were right next to the bank. 
and we see significant changes of behaviour during this time. Pre-spawning, the carp will gather up down the shallows and they can be relatively easy to catch. Once spawning is finished, we'll see the carp sitting tight to the margins, sunbathing, just chilling, just relaxing, recovering their strength post-spawning. It's really like someone flicks a switch because pre-spawning you won't see any carp just kind of sitting up in the layers like this. So I'm going to see if I can sneak onto the island and show you some of these fish just sat underneath the marginal cover. Let's go and have a look. Yeah, they're, they're, they're there underneath this big fir tree. Oh yeah, they're there in number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. a lot of fish under it. But this is the first time they've been here. I've been here for a couple of weeks and doing daily walks of the lake and I haven't seen fish sat underneath this bush at all. The last spawning activity was 24 hours ago and all of a sudden, boom, they're sat in the margins tight underneath the cover. And he looks big from here. One of the biggest challenges with owning or running a lake is knowing when to interfere with nature and knowing when to leave nature to get on and do what it does best. So here we are in the spring and the trees are shedding debris like they always do and it's just caught on the wind and blown into this corner. Now my first instinct is to remove this because eventually it's going to sink and just decompose on the bottom. But actually there's a lot of life beneath this debris. The other day I found some baby pike just about that big. Perfect little predators. So I'm going to have a little scoop today, see what else I can find. Here we go. Oh my word. Yeah. One. Two. Yeah. Tiny little miniature predators hiding underneath this uh, this tree debris here. All right, let's get them back. Up. Up. So while those scoops have removed a little bit of debris, I'm also going to leave some of that because it creates a habitat for life, and it's all about that balance between the various species. Every species has a role to play in a lake. Making sure there's enough oxygen available to the fish at all times of year is the most important part of my job. And the level of oxygen varies throughout the day, season to season. So it's something we have to keep a very, very close eye on. During the winter, oxygen levels aren't a concern because cold water holds far more oxygen than warm water. Oxygen level is about its worst during periods of really hot weather and this can be a very dangerous time for the fish. That's at 6.5 to 6.6 .6, and that reading is taken at 23.5 degrees C at about 9.30 in the morning so uh, yeah that's a pretty good reading for June um, and uh, what we've got to watch is that um, when the algae gets too bad and the oxygen level goes up and down that this reading if this reading was around kind of uh, like three or four then I'd be worried and it's time to turn the aerators on. But it's important that algae is kept under control because too much algae will produce too much oxygen and then overnight consume too much oxygen. So we have this big swing between daytime and nighttime in terms of oxygen levels. So it's really important to keep the water moving and circulating. On a big water that's windswept and open, the air will simply do this. So it'll keep the, the lake well oxygenated because that wind's pushing across the surface and it's moving and stirring the water up all the time, lifting that stale water from the bottom up to the top. The best way that we've found of actually boosting the oxygen levels is through direct mechanical aeration. Mm. These are surface aerators, splash aerators that draw large quantities of water up, spray it up into the air where it can become oxygenated and fall down. Yeah. And we have 
two of these on site permanently. During the summer months where oxygen is in short supply, these create large safe areas where the fish can live and feed very happily. So if you're fishing in the summer, then fishing near to one of these aerators, if they're running, is a really good idea. Given the fact that oxygen levels are temperature dependent, you'd have thought that as we went from summer into the autumn, that the oxygen levels would start to recover. But that's not what happens. Because what happens in the autumn is that the trees lose their leaves. And as the leaves fall in the water, they put an additional load on the system because oxygen is required to break down this organic matter. So the oxygen levels in the autumn sit at around four or five milligrams, which isn't great, but it's still good enough for a bite. So it's a very exciting day today because we're gonna get a delivery of new fish. Now this is something that we don't do every year. In fact, we haven't made a stocking here since 2018. So that's six years since we've introduced new fish. Now we always do this during the winter because fish are cold blooded carp, specifically the cold blooded creatures. We're gonna be transporting fish across France and you know, we need to do that when the temperature is cold because that will keep the fish calmer and reduces the stress that they go through when, when they're being moved. The downside is that during the winter we got no control over the weather and we've had a real cold snap this morning and 70% of the lake is frozen. Now that's a bit of a problem because when we introduce the fish after their move the first thing they're going to want to do is they're going to come, want to come up to the surface and do something called porpoising and this porpoising action is them rebalancing their swim bladders because they're going to be in a tank for a number of hours during the transit process and they're going to go into the lake and they need to rebalance their swim bladders to make themselves more comfortable so that they can move as they would normally move with their swim bladder to control their height in the water and if there's a lid of ice on the surface then they can't do this it increases stress levels it makes them unwell and can actually cause in worst case scenario fatalities so my first job this morning is I need to bust up some of this ice and I need to do it fairly gently because actually breaking the ice, you know, is going to shock the fish that are resident fish that are in there. I have no idea how this is going to go and uh, yeah, see how it goes. As always in this game, the timing is what the timing is. I ordered these fish a year ago. We kind of been planning this delivery for a, a number of months now, and yeah, the weather's gone and uh, done, a, done a number on us. This is the first time that the lake's been frozen over to this extent all year, and it just happens to be on fish delivery day. So uh, um, you can see the boats going through the, uh, the thin ice without a problem, but I can't get very far into it before it absolutely jams solid. And uh, I don't really fancy getting stuck out there frozen in the boat. I'm just going to have to be really careful and just kind of skirt around the edges. Um, hopefully there's going to be uh, enough open water for the fish to uh, do their porpoising. Probably introduce them down the shallow side where there's lots of ice free water. And hopefully that will encourage them to uh, go that direction and avoid the deeper water for the for the minute once they've rebalanced their swim bladders then they're going to be absolutely fine in these conditions it's not a problem at all but uh, yeah as always we just got to do the very best that we can for these new additions to the fishery So? Well, they're here. <laughs> well, there we go, seven new additions to the fishery. Lovely fish, those between 25 and 30 pounds, all that's kind of marked. So, uh, hopefully, they're going to do really well for us in the years to come, and I'm sure they're going to make a lot of anglers very happy. 
So tree management is a massive part of the work that we do here. And we were working here yesterday, taking out some marginal trees. Now, some of those were kind of dead and leaning over and just kind of, there were too many trees along this margin. So time for a good tidy up. What we're going to do behind the margin is cut some of this laurel away and that's going to create a, a wind channel, a wind lane. Basically it's going to help the air move over the surface of the lake and that will help with aeration and moving the water around. The immediate effect is the airflow over the water but the secondary effect is we're going to get less leaf fall next autumn which is always a good thing. So there's a classic example here of what happens to trees and how they how they get weakened and died basically. So there's some there's some mushrooms, some champignons here that are just clinging to the outside of this laurel uh, laurel trunk here. And uh, if you see that on any tree, it's a sign that basically that tree is uh, not long for this world and will uh, will weaken and die. So uh, you can see. We can see the internal evidence in the tree structure of this. There's some softening of the heartwood there, some porosity. So that's given us a 10 metre wide wind lane right across the middle of the lake. So that's really going to open up the view. It's also going to get the air moving across the water and getting some air and oxygen into the lake just when we need it. Oh dear, I don't know why I thought of that, but uh, it's, just the, it, it's all just a byproduct. <laughs> It's all just a byproduct product of having fun, really. <laughs> There's a line from Mark. Byproduct of having fun. The other thing that we do annually to control the amount of silt and the rate at which it builds up is we apply lime. Now, this isn't the sort of lime that you use in the building industry for making a lime mortar. This is agricultural grade lime and it's applied very carefully in three phases in a controlled manner. Uh, it's really important to get the dose absolutely right for each lake because if it's overdone it actually poses a risk to fish. The lime has two roles to play. First of all it sterilises the bugs and parasites that might live in the silt. It also acts as an accelerant. It accelerates the rate of decomposition of any organic matter. Agricultural lime is 98% calcium carbonate, and this is an essential mineral for the bug life to build their exoskeletons. Daphnia cannot survive if there's not enough calcium carbonate available. It's the same for freshwater mussels, freshwater shrimps, and all such sorts of aquatic insect life that live in a lake. By annually treating the lake with lime we reinforce these building blocks of the aquatic system. Here we can see a cloud of Daphnia that there's absolutely billions of these things. They're little water fleas only about a millimetre across. Carp and all fish love Daphnia. They're very rich in protein, about 40% protein. So they're a very good source of nutrition for fish. The banks of any lake are also under constant erosion. Wind causes waves and waves gradually lap away and erode the banks. The banks will become undercut over time. This gradual process of undercutting means that the banks are less stable and any trees that are right next to the water can eventually fall in. As well as the wind and the rain and the weather eroding the banks, we've also got brown rats, muskrats and koipu. Koipu are very large non-native species and they can be up to 10 kilos in size. They love nothing better than to dig massive holes in dam walls and they can cause an incredible amount of damage. They can literally be the end of a fishery as they wipe out a dam wall. Wherever you find water in France, you'll find koipu and they're absolutely everywhere. Some fisheries are absolutely infestated with them. A few years ago, we were forced to take action and we had a hundred tons of rock inserted into the margins to stabilize them. As well as digging holes and tunneling, Koipu can also cause havoc with aeration systems. Try 
I want to disturb the little bird's nest that are up there. A coipu are vegetarian, but they've got massive teeth, like three centimetre long incisors, so uh, you really don't want to get bitten by one. They are vegetarian, but they've got a nasty habit of gnawing electrical cables. Don't know why, but there's something in the rubber and the plastics that they use in the manufacture of cables that they absolutely love. Now you can see the damage there. It's still okay, this cable. It's still pumping electricity. I'm not going to put my fingers too close to it, but uh, definitely some abrasion damage there. And you can see a few cut marks, and that looks like koi pew to me. So I've got some damage here on a cable, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, sheathe it, basically put some conduit over the top. It doesn't really matter about the cable on the bottom of the lake, they don't seem interested in that, but they like to gnaw things around the surface level of the lake or cables that are exposed above the surface level. Got him. Oops. Oh, it's a little bit fresh. So I've got a little something interesting to show you. I'm just on my way to the pessary. I was uh, cleaning out of leaves this morning and um, I've realized there's loads of little fish in there. Roach, and tench even, so uh, I'm going to see if I can catch them and put them back in my lake because I'll leave them where they are. Mr. Heron's going to get them. Yeah, there you go. Look at that. <laughs> oh my word. What an absolute little cracker. That's fantastic. We've got a load of rud. I'm pretty sure that these have gotten uh, washed over the grill during the rain and uh, they found out their way into the pessary. So if I leave them here then the heron's going to get them. Right, fantastic. First scoop and there must be 20 little fish in there. Let's see what else we can find. Yeah, what I don't want to do, I don't want to transfer a load of leaf to my bucket. That's why I'm doing these one at a time. Slippery little fellas. Ah, that's a, that's a baby tench. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I used to love tench fishing as a boy. Waggler, sweet corn, fantastic. Let's get him in. Yeah, baby swan mussel as well. Right, that bucket's getting quite full already. <laughs> so I'm going to move them straight over into the main lake and uh, yeah, put them back to where they should be. Right, let's slip these back, eh? There we go. Fantastic. Even the malt. Well, this is bucket number three. I can still feel them banging around my ankles, so I'm not done yet. Well, that was fun. Three buckets in total in the end, so I can't get them all, of course, but there's hundreds in there. Uh, I've left the rest in there. They'll probably be picked off by the heron eventually kingfishers will have a few as well but yeah that's all part of nature's great balance every species has a role to play the roach the perch the pike the zander as well as our specimen carp and catfish it's all part of a complicated ecosystem that has to be kept in balance the smaller species such as roach are prolific egg eaters and we need the roach to clean up the eggs that are laid after the carp spawn because otherwise all of those carp eggs could develop in and hatch into actual carp fry. We had that happen once in 2015 and before we knew it we were overrun with thousands of carp. The maximum capacity of this lake for a specimen carp is about a hundred so there's no way that we could just welcome in thousands of baby carp. It's just not sustainable. Now, left unchecked, roach can breed prolifically. So we need predatory species such as perch, pike and zander to keep the roach in check as well. Despite the fact that we had to give away thousands of baby carp, we did actually manage to keep some specimens and they've grown on steadily 
in this lake along with their larger brothers and sisters. It's a lot of responsibility to own a lake. It's far more complicated than we could possibly ever imagine. There's been so much to learn. And we haven't got it right all the time. You know, we've made some mistakes. We've really messed things up. It's been a long, complicated journey, but it's been so worth it because we absolutely love this place. Seeing these young fish grow on under our care has been a wonderful part of the journey, uh, a real kind of icing on the cake, if you like. We continue to learn year on year and the journey continues. Well, if we look at the carp fishing science, then we know that from the numbers that on average during a given year, carp eat 1.5% of their body weight every single day. So what does that mean? If you've got a thousand kilo of carp, they will eat 15 kilo of bait in addition to their natural food source. That's an awful lot of food, and that's the average during a year. Now, obviously, some lakes are gonna have more than a thousand kilo of carp, other lakes are gonna have a lot less. Here, we've got about 1,300 kilo of carp, which is quite a lot. So that comes out to be 18 kilos on average every single day. That's a lot of food. Now, this figure of one and a half percent goes up and down. You know, in the depths of winter, carp don't need much food they're probably not eating at all in fact but if you've got water temperature of 10 degrees so you've got double figures carp are probably going to be eating about one percent of their body mass per day in the spring in the run-up to spawning that figure might go to two percent it might go to two and a half percent so they really are seriously on the munch if you've got the right combination of temperature and oxygen levels carp can eat a huge amount of food. The main driver at this time of year is lake temperature. Air temperature is going to go up and down all over the place. Uh, a couple of days ago I woke up to minus one degree, uh, very very cold in the morning. Uh, a couple of days later it was nine degrees first thing in the morning so the temperature might be up and down all over the place but the water temperature is always much slower to react. So I'm going to be measuring the water temperature later and I expect it to be uh, probably about nine degrees something like that eight nine degrees so I haven't done any fishing for the last four weeks. We've been resting on the fish at the end of the season, but I have been visiting every couple of days to feed the fish. And most importantly, I've been testing to see whether they are eating the food that I'm giving them. Because if I don't know whether they're eating it, then I really shouldn't be putting more feed in. Now, bearing in mind that I'm doing this from a fishery management standpoint, you know, this is not the sort of thing that you'd, do, you'd necessarily do as, a, as an angler because it, it can be very, very expensive. So we're coming up on the mark now and I'm just going to have a little prod around because it's the back of the mark that I'm interested in because I've pulled the mark afloat from the back of the spot to the front of the spot. So it's the ground behind the marker that I'm interested in looking at. So even where the lead is, even though I felt it go a little bit softer there, it's still pretty firm. If I move back, there we go. That's really, really solid ground there. It's a metre back from the marker. And then a metre 50, I'm in the softer stuff there. So I know this spot quite well. We call it the dining table, basically because it's done a load of bites. And I can feel it's about a metre to the left of that marker. It's a little soft. And yeah, within half a metre, I'm really on some very firm ground there. Right behind the marker. Yeah, so I've absolutely... I'm really on the money on that spot. It's not a big spot. It's probably about one and a half metres by one and a half metres, something like that. So my prodding stick is actually a tube and that enables me to take a sample of the lake bed from directly behind this spot, use it as a suction stick. I'm going to pick it up 
and let it out. A little bit dirty actually that. I didn't see any bait. This spot, I'd only tried it for the first time last night. This is not one of my pre-baited spots. We're going to have a look at one of my pre-baited spots now. See how dirty that was. But before I leave this spot, I'm going to do another type of test, which is the scrape test. And this is perfect for uh, the boilies, because I put about a kilo of boilie on this spot yesterday. So this old thing is actually a fishery scoop net, but it's perfect for a bait and scrape tool. I would not do this with a landing net, it'll absolutely destroy it. But this heavy stainless frame is robust enough for the job. I'm really digging it into the bottom here, scraping away, and then want to pick it up. There's absolutely nothing in it, no sign of bait whatsoever. And so it confirms what I thought that basically they've completely cleaned this, this out. So even though I didn't actually have a pickup from here, I think I had a massive liner on this spot, but they've cleaned me out anyway. So this is uh, this is one of my favourite uh, bait and feed spots, just because it's. Uh, really easy to to find it's just off the end of a, a fir tree that overhangs the island there and I put a lot of bait on this this month didn't put any last night but it did get a kilo the night before uh, it's a good scrape and again and absolutely clean as a whistle because I've been routinely baiting this every couple of days for a month, I know that this spot is incredibly clean. So we could, should get, yeah, damn near crystal clean that. I mean, that's water directly from the bottom of the lake and there's, there's hardly any sediment there at all. So carp have incredibly efficient filtration systems. Only 1% of carp poo is silt. So if you find a, a clean polished spot like this, it's simply down to the action of the carp. Nothing else can do this. You can just see a bit of grey and that's the mineral content of the of the bottom of the lake basically. So virtually no silt in there at all. Beautiful. There's no guessing with this uh, with this type of fishing. I absolutely know 100% where they're eating, when they're eating how much they're eating so if you can do that in your fishing it's an incredibly uh, powerful thing to be able to do because it tells you so much now just because i know that they're fish they're feeding on these spots there's absolutely no guarantee of a pickup these are very very clued up fish the big mirror that i had last night that carp has not been caught all year and the one before that i had as well hadn't been caught all year that seven month of angling pressure and no one has put these carp on the bank so they are incredibly good at picking up and ejecting rigs so obviously i'm very lucky to be in the position of having my own lake and being able to do this type of work uh, and very few of you are going to be able to uh, you know recreate this you, you know if you've got access to a set of waders or a boat then yeah absolutely you can do that and, and do 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 that prove it to yourself so now that we've seen that the spot is relatively clean and they've cleaned all out the bait that I put in there yesterday, it's time to get a, give them a bit more and uh, let's have another spin of the wheel. Just back and left of the spot, I'm gonna drop my cup of mix there. Then we're gonna turn ourselves around and I'm gonna position the rig right on that spot. So I'm just gonna eyeball it at very close range. So I'm actually, underarming the rig in position and this way I'll get a nice presentation of the rig. I'm laying the rig flat basically. So I'm going to swing past, there we go, bunk, beautiful, perfect. Just behind and left of the marker and we can row him back to shore.
Okay, drain down time 2022, time to lift that first board. Now the water's flowing, I've got to jump down the pestery with a rake and get all the leaves out, otherwise we won't get the water safely down the street. So this year we're doing a partial drain down. Now this means that the fish are actually going to stay resident within the lake, but we're going to reduce the level until there's about a metre of water left and that concentrates the fish so that they're easier to net. Now we do this to basically manage the stocking levels because if we have too many small fish then there won't be enough room for the larger fish to grow. If we didn't do a partial drain down and netting every few years then the small fish would basically eat all the food that we want the larger fish to enjoy. There's basically just not enough food to go around. Drain downs have to be done very slowly so it doesn't mess up the surrounding environment. So one of the things I'm looking to do when I'm actually doing a drain down is maintaining some kind of water exchange. This is important for the health of the lake and the fish. So I'm going to pop over the road, have a look at what the level is and see if we're starting to get that water exchange that we need. So we're very lucky at Boast Lake because the lake above us actually feeds down into us during the winter. Basically we take their overflow. We had a lot of rain last night and I know the level's been coming up and I'm really hoping that we're just starting to see a little bit of water exchange. So it's really good news, it's just started to flow. So the inflow stream is behind me here and we're just starting to see a little bit of water coming over the weir. So a successful drain down is all about managing how much water is coming in versus how much water is going out. So this is day three of the drain down and we've lost about 40 centimetres already. There's not another board to lift today. I'm just going to take out a couple of the front boards because they're no longer necessary. Those front boards are actually there for a purpose because they force the water to go under them and then up over the weir. This means that the overflow is always sucking from the bottom, which helps us keep the lake cleaner. So while we're doing the drain down, it's an excellent time of year to get on with those winter jobs, which is trimming the margins. We do as much of this as we can with the brush cutter, but at the end of the day, there's no substitute for a pair of loppers and a pair of shears. So estate lakes might be beautiful places to come and fish, but there's a price to pay, and that's in leaf fall. So every year you'll find me in the margins digging out the leaf hole just to keep the lake as clean as possible. While I've been digging out this margin, I always find little surprises and today I've found some mussel shells. So mussels do a fantastic job of actually filtering the water. So here we go. Beautiful shells these. Absolutely gorgeous things. But unfortunately, Mr. Muskrat got his fill. So the next job on my list is I've got to remove the fizzers from the shallow end of the lake. Now we've had a diffused air system in place since 2015 and that does a great job of turning over our water 24-7, 365 days of the year. But during a drain down, the fizzers run out of water and I've got to isolate them, pull them out on the bank because they basically won't be doing anything and just wasting electricity. So the level's dropped low enough now that I can take another board out. At the same time, I'm going to take out a couple of front boards. At this point, we'll be about 60 centimetres down in total. This is a great opportunity to inspect the condition of the board, just to make sure that there's no wear or holes that need to be replaced. This board is in fine condition. There's a bit of degradation on the surface, but it's really nothing. It's in very good condition indeed. So I've just walked into a feeding hole here and this hole definitely wasn't here last time. There were some other holes around this area, but this hole was not here. Now, what's interesting is that uh, in the last week of the season, we had a visit from one of our regulars, and he said that he was having quite a few off a spot, which is just in front of this rock here, about half a rod length out. So I've wandered along to this spot, and what have I found? Well, there's a two meter diameter feeding hole, 
right right on the money basically and um, just just here I found an old log and I can feel it, I can touch it, it's not stone, I lift it up, yeah no it's definitely definitely a log and I can feel there that the carp have excavated along that and then they've created this huge great feeding area here so there's been something really really delicious that they wanted to eat and uh, yeah I mean he was just driving out rigs with his bait boat, dropping them right on the money. He didn't actually know that this was here, but the fish were crashing over this spot, so they were visually giving themselves away. So, but this is the result of carp feeding activity, and yeah, if you can find a hole like this, it's going to be a really productive place to fish. So it's absolutely bang hard there. That's that's really the kind of lowest depression there. But if I go just you know, a, a metre away. We've got six inches of muck there, it's really horrible. Put my boot in that. Yeah, it's a big, big old, uh, big old load of muck. Location, 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 really. You know, if you're just a metre off, you're going to be right on the edge of this, uh, this hole. So, uh, even driving this out with a bait boat is very, very difficult to get it, to get it spot on, to be honest. Unless you're driving it into your feet, which is something I do a lot. So there we go, that's the logs, that's the fallen branch. Oh, I can have that out actually. So good fishery management is all about good silt management. And here at Beausoleil we have an inlet stream. Now, if we just let the winter overflow from the neighbouring lake just cascade into our lake all year round, it would mean that there would be a lot of silt that is washed over, especially during the winter rains. So what we've done is we've installed two weirs, and these force the water up over them. Basically what it achieves is a double silt trap effect, so that uh, silt builds up behind the weirs, and then is filtered, and then flows over to another pool, and is filtered again before it finally enters into our lake. This is a really effective system and it helps keep the lake cleaner all year round. Over time, the silt level behind each of the weir rises. And if we didn't remove that silt every couple of years, it would mean that the silt could get washed over during the rains. So a big day tomorrow because we're going to have a digger come on site and this machine is going to excavate that silt, this silt that's been building up over the last few years, and that silt is going to be removed deposited along the margin and then scraped flat. We can't get everything out with the machine of course so the bits that the digger can't reach I'll just be hopping in the margin and digging those out by hand. So the dig out the stream has gone really well this morning, so well in fact that I've got Peter in the lake digging out the other bits that he can access. So uh, really important work to get this done but while we're in the drain down. So we're making the most of the machine and the man's time. He's, uh, he's really confident with that machine. I must say, I've had a few kind of twitchy moments watching him go in the soft stuff. So this is a bit of a surprise. I don't think this rock should be here. I think it's fallen. I'd have to go back and check the footage, but I'm pretty sure that it was actually tucked up underneath the island here. It's moved maybe a big catfish has moved it or just kind of uh, erosion over time probably a bit of both really but i'm sure that this rock has fallen from there where it was down to uh, down to this position here lakes evolve lakes change and they're changing all the all the time every couple of years i find things that simply weren't here last time i checked so drain downs are a fantastic opportunity for me to get rubbish like this out of the lake. I hate to see stuff like this because Ronnie rigs are banned at the venue and I really don't encourage the use of lead clips either. But it's a reality of fishery ownership and every lake will contain rubbish like this that should be extracted if at all possible. So I hate to see this, this tail rubber has been pushed on really hard and if I just try and remove this lead, I have to pull quite hard. Oh, and he, he does he does come off. I've seen a lot worse than this. One of my favourite tools for finding lost rigs and stuff is actually just a simple garden rake because I can rake that across the silt. There's, the rake catches on the main line. I then follow the main line back and then I can find any broken off rig components etc. 
So I'm just having a mooch around the bridge here and um, I saw this uh, piece of rig tube sticking up out the uh, out the thing. Nothing attached to it so it's all uh, it's all safe, just another bit of debris, debris to get out of the lake really. So I'm very surprised to see this. This is a uh, pike trace and a lure connected to some braided main line. Yeah, a bit concerning to see because uh, that's not the sort of fishing that we do here. But anyway, happy to have found it and got it out of the water. So I'm really happy with that actually. A couple of years ago I found loads of rigs around this bridge but I've only found three today. So uh, we have been very, very strict with the um, insistence on £20 uh, Nash Bullet as main line or £25 big game. And I, I think this has helped. I'm also very rigorous nowadays on the rig checks and I've got loads of guys now coming here and doing the tuition where we can get all of this sort of thing sorted on the bank so that uh, you know fish aren't lost and gear isn't lost as well so uh, very rare nowadays to see guys using lead clips here because I really discourage that after what I saw a couple of years ago uh, basic running inline lead is super effective super safe so it's only six days to go before the netting and we've still got a fair amount of water to remove so I'm going to pull another board out today and then we'll have another one out in a couple of days and then possibly one more right before the netting. So while I've been doing my tour looking for rigs and stuff I've noticed that one of the stanchions on the bridge is looking quite badly worn. While the level's down it's really important that we take care of this otherwise there's the risk of this stanchion actually failing and we're not going to be able to see this part of the bridge for another two years. So what I want to do now is just cut off the end of those threaded bars because I really don't want the carp bumping into those as they go about their daily business and stuff because the, those threaded bars are really sharp and it will really damage them. So as you can see we've dropped a lot of level now, there's just 30 centimetres more to go before we're ready to net the place. As we drop the level I always walk around the shallows and I'm looking for any mussels that have got stranded that are not either deeply submerged in the soft silt or in the water because I don't want those mussels to dry out and die because they're very good for the health of the water. So, so I'm going to wander around the shallows now and I'm going to gather up any mussels that I find and I'm going to plop them into deeper pools or places I know that are going to stay nice and wet while the level is low. In a week or so the level is going to be coming back up into these shallows to cover them up so they're all going to be fine. <laughs> look, look at those animal prints. Now I'm not sure that could be a rat, could be a muskrat, but clear sign of um, paw and claw prints there. So obviously after these two two mussels, maybe they're a bit big for him. But uh, anyway, we'll rescue them. He's just sealing up there. Yeah, put you in a safe place, mate. Eh? So we've got a mussel here that's been carving his track, goes around in an S bend like this and the water's going to drop lower than this so I need to move this one as well. The colours on that, absolutely stunning. That's mad isn't it, it's like a racetrack, we've had racing mussels. So that's it, I've filled my bucket and I've got a nice big pool of water here that's going to stay filled up during the netting. Here we are. Here we are. Big pile of mussels. Good luck chaps. I don't know exactly what it, this is but ah it is <laughs> I think someone's used that as a prodding pole from the boat and basically dropped it so uh, yeah look at that it's an old Nashi camlock bank stick and it still works. <laughs> That's mad. Looks like the Nash one, I'm not sure. Could be another make, but anyway, it survived and still kind of works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something else. So I don't find many spots and spoms around the place, but I have just found this one and uh, good to get him out the water. You know, whenever we go fishing unfortunately you know, stuff does get lost so what we fish with you know 
you've got to think about what happens when the worst does happen and we do lose it because it does stay in the environment. It's also really important if you are using spods and spawns that you set them up properly, that you use a proper braided leader you know, to take the shock of the cast and that you change those leaders and the, the spod line on a regular basis. Right, it's just 24 hours to go now before we're going to be netting the place. The level is 10 centimetres down from where I want it and I can just see the first signs of uh, fish movement at that level some tail patterns and some ripples and a little bit of a uh, few bow waves and stuff so uh, I think we're just about spot on for level. To minimise the stress on the fish it's really important that we have a nice cold day for the netting and ideally a kind of cold run up to the netting as well. Air temperature this morning was about two degrees, there's a little bit of breeze and there's a real nip in the air, it's really kind of fresh. Uh, no frost this morning, might even have a few flakes of snow for the netting tomorrow. The water temperature is going to be sub 10 degrees for sure, which is absolutely where we need it to be. So the level is so low now that we can really see very clearly the massive cat holes that uh, are exposed in this area. These holes are two, three metres diameter and they're 50, even 80 centimetres deep. And they, they've been carved out of the silt by the big cats swimming in circles and literally excavating themselves a nest. It's a really incredible feature. They're quite difficult to find um, because you can pull a lead across them and you really won't feel much because it's very, very loopy down here. But uh, uh, the best way to find them is actually to go out in the rowing boat and very, very lightly tap with the prodding pole. If you're looking for a hole like this casting from the bank then I would use a very light lead and literally just kind of cast and cast and cast and if you go kind of soft, soft, soft and then you get a firm thud you might have landed in a hole and that's a great place to drop a rig. Well it's netting day this morning and it's even snowing. Never done a netting in the snow but the weather gives us what it gives us. Uh, the boys are getting prepped now. I'm on the sidelines today because I'm injured but fortunately we've got a great team of people here that are going to do all the hard graft for us. Dogs are getting interested. It's not as bad in the middle. If I remember last time, it's quite bad in the middle, but it cleans up in the middle. So it looks like the netting's gone pretty well, net's now in and uh, we can certainly see plenty of fish action. It looks like we've got a very successful sweep. Not much sign of active fish activity the other side of the net, which is always a good sign. So uh, net's going to be staked into position now and then we're going to set up some cages and we'll start sorting through these fish. So we know the net actually went over a big hole and uh, all the big uh, catfish actually kind of ducked under the net so we missed them this time but uh, not to worry the main objective was to get all the smaller fish out the silvers and stuff that we don't need. In the average carp sizes really really come on leaps and bounds. Some of the small carp that were born in here in 2015 they're, they're now upper double some are pushing uh, you know 27 28 pounds which is really really fantastic growth. We saw plenty of 30s, plenty of 40s as well and uh, certainly a couple of the big highlight fish were definitely in that netting so uh, yeah great to see. So the Xander population has come on really strong which I'm really really pleased with because they are only introduced at you know 20 centimetres long and uh, now they're up to 40-50 centimetres long which is really great. This is all about balancing the biomass and we're be able, going to be able to free up that biomass so that the carp which is what we want to grow can get even bigger. So the netting's all done and it's time to let the water back in. I want to be really careful how I let the water in because I don't want any wash over from the lake above so it's all about just getting a nice steady flow that's really clean and really pure. We've got some lovely crystal clear water that's going to flow into the lake and fill us up over a number of weeks. At the bottom of the weir here I've got some limestone chippings and this just helps to add a little bit of calcium very slowly and steadily into the water. This is just a way of improving water quality over a long period of time as it washes into the lake. So we've got a golden opportunity while we're refilling just for a couple of days to get the digger back again to uh, 
basically get in there and dig out some of these shallows, really clean them up, get out some of the muck, because it's going to do wonders for the water quality and really improve the health of the fishery. So it's all about just moving it forward year by year, as we've been doing so for the last 12 years. So you can see what Peter's doing here, he's literally scraping off the top layer of muck and exposing these wonderfully different coloured clays and carp absolutely love this fresh scraped clay so they're going to be down here and having an absolute ball. So we're back underneath the Island Point fir tree here and uh, this is a classic spot the carp spend an awful lot of time under here and we visited this spot a couple of years ago and we did some filming under here and uh, we removed the snag that was exposed and uh, you know there was nothing else we took all of the exposed roots out to, to make it nice and clean and we've come back to this spot and, and what have we got? They've, they've dug out two more roots to the tune of uh, what? Another 10 centimetres down or something? Yeah, absolutely mad and it's over a large area as well. This spot is uh, it's one and a half metres wide by uh, by metre meter across. It's absolutely been scoured to win it within an inch of its life so uh, yeah mental um, but that's what carp do you know they just eat the bottom so I've come to a spot that we filmed a couple of years ago and uh, this is just positioned midway along the aerator bar and last time we were on the aerator bar filming it was covered in feeding holes and they'd picked it really really clean and uh, this year it's all looking a bit dirty actually there there is a clean area of feeding but it's certainly not in the middle of the bar it's further along so it just goes to show you how uh, carp habits change and move and evolve and just because you're fishing a spot that you did well on the year before you go back to it the next year and expect to have the same kind of results don't be surprised if that doesn't happen because the carp have changed habits they've moved and the the game has changed 